You ready to get rejuvenated? I've been looking recently for rejuvenation because I felt a sense of crisis. And when I step back... So Kenneth Brown seems to be going through a tough time. I, I presume that uh, he was invested in crypto and has taken an absolute bath because of the crypto downturn. So you'll notice many of the quirks of the e-personality coming out here. So when people go online, they tend to be much more morbid. They they lack the, the, the boundaries that people tend to have much more readily in real life where you're looking at people face to face. So go online, start sharing. You'll be a lot more morbid. You, you share a lot more dark stuff than you would face to face. So it sounds like uh, Ken Brown, aka Deep Left Jokal, is going through a tough time. Now, this guy's sounding more and more like Millennial Woes, and he has a lot in common with Millennial Woes. Like, neither of them seem to have a mean bone in their body, right? I, I don't see Millennial Woes or Ken Brown being nasty. I don't see them getting into feuds. I don't see them abusing their power to take advantage of people. Well, maybe maybe they, maybe uh, Millennial was a little pesty, but... Overall, neither of them strike me as nasty, vicious, you know, feud-loving blokes. Back and I examine, and I analyze the sense of crisis. It comes from, it comes from certain illusions. It's not grounded in reality. So the idea that I'm going to lose all of my money, or the idea that I'm going to hit a certain threshold where essentially I'll be paralyzed in my body. I'll be paralyzed in my body watching the world go on without me. So he wouldn't be speaking this way if he was face to face, right? He probably wouldn't be speaking this way if he had people in his life that he could share with. So I've certainly used the internet to give vent to my darkest fears. So I, I empathize with what he's going through and he's doing this video to calm himself down. Uh, he's doing this video to recenter himself. He's doing this video to feel more comfortable in his body. And that will be terrifying. These are, you know, ridiculous things. But I think there's a list of these sort of fantasies, these nightmares, these waking nightmares, these crises that are at the root of every, of every um, crisis. You know, the belief is like, well, I'm going to lose some money, but that's connected to the concept of losing all your money. So I think in every small little upset, there's always a kind of apocalyptic chrysalis or kernel or seed. But I so I remember on J Swipe and on Tinder girls would often ask me, where are your investments? And I'd say, my investments are in my family. My investments are in my community. My investments are in my friends. And when people ask me, how are you hedging against inflation? I used to say, oh, I invest in community. Seriously, that's the best way to survive tough times. Community, friends. It's even better than U.S. Treasuries. The U.S. Treasuries help too. But I also think out of every crisis, every crisis is, is concerning a sense of loss, like losing all your money, the opposite would be having lots of money because money represents power, so we want power. Or instead of losing all your money, if you if you were to watch the world roll by, the opposite would be to be involved in the world, to be really active and really change the world, which is another form of power. Right, so if you're afraid you're going broke, if you're afraid that life is passing you by, if you're afraid that you're on the outside looking in, then the answer is to take some, some form of action, right? To, to step up. I mean, he really needs to go to the Center for Healthy Sex and listen to some of these Mirror of Intimacy webinars with Alex Kalahakis. With all of its possibilities. So intention, um, first of all, you have to have your attention on what it is you're seeking. So very different vibe here between the Ken Brown video and the Alex Kalahakis video. So Alex Kalahakis videos is just jam packed with useful insights, with, with, with tips, with, with inspiration, with, with common sense, with wisdom, with, with the learning that uh, she has had. And set your intention for that. And then you have to take action. And those three things will move you towards what it is you say you want. So I want to remind you that if you have any questions or comments to please uh, type them into the chat box and I'll do my best to answer them for you. So what precedes sexuality, of course, and love is courtship. And courtship also requires action. And um, courtship is a funny word because it sounds dated or old or even ancient in some ways. And courtship changes, you know, from um, 
era to era, what used to be courtship, let's say, in Elizabethan times where... So watching a lot of Millennial Woes videos and watching a lot of Cam Brown videos, they're like watching a car, car wreck. And then watching Alex Katahakis videos is watching something inspiring and useful and good for you. Two people were matched together and often there was a chaperone in the simplest of conversations. It was considered immodest to be in a room alone with someone um, of the opposite sex. And if you were same sex attracted, you certainly had to do that in secret. Um, courtship today can look like, um, you know, pinging someone. When are you going to catch her live, Luke, and ask her some questions? I don't really have any questions for her. I mean, I think she's amazing. But it's not like I I'm walking around with all these questions. You know, how should I, how should I really you know, conduct things? I don't have any burning questions. So I talk to a lot of people who are confused and they're burning questions and they're just so passive. Oh, I don't know how to do step nine or just don't know how to work on my goals pages or I don't know how to do step four or I'm confused about column three in the step four inventory or I don't know what steps I need to take to take, get a better night's sleep or you know, I've got this, this pain in my butt and I don't know what exercises to do. I'm a man who takes action. When I got those problems, I take action. I reach out to people. I Google. I research. I watch videos by Alex Katahakis. One on a dating site um, and then texting with them and then maybe having a Zoom call and eventually... Oh, no, mummy question. Well, I don't really have questions about mother hunger, mummy hunger, because I know the things that I need to do to address my mother hunger and I'm doing those things. So I don't have any burning questions of which I'm aware on how to address my mother hunger. A coffee date um, to see if you're compatible enough to actually go on a, what we would consider more of a quote, real date or traditional date. But this all requires action regardless of what your standard of courtship is. And oftentimes one person is complaining. That so I know a lot of people that their idea of taking action in this department is to get on Tinder or to get on J Swipe. And those are easy things to do and probably better than nothing, but insufficient. But the other person isn't initiating the courtship fast enough, like he or she or they don't call um, or something along those lines. And then once people get into relationship, there can be complaints about who's initiating sex and why one person initiates and the other doesn't. Uh, but I want to really impress upon everyone and all of us that sex is not only initiated genitally, um, that this is an old, old construct of sex and sexuality, that sex can be transmitted through a gaze, a simple look across the room, the tone of voice, because it's the intention that moves things into action, not the final. This is a great point. Don't go stampeding after the clitoris. Why do you always want to go stampeding after the clitoris? What's wrong with a good kiss on the lips? What's wrong with a gaze across the room? What's wrong with talking to her about her favorite podcast? What's wrong with going to synagogue together? What's wrong with going for a nice walk on the street? Why are they stampeding to the clitoris, guys? No action itself. There are all these small measures and steps that have to be taken in order to get us into our preferred state or preferred goal. So think about any large endeavor. Sex is a smaller endeavor, but a larger endeavor like a career path or going to college um, or deciding to get a higher education. You don't just decide you're going to go and get a bachelor. So this is a woman who got a PhD and then she founded this great place, Center for Healthy Sex. She's helped hundreds of people. She's published three books. She's a highly accomplished, highly intelligent woman who's made many major contributions to a field. Her approach is uh, sex addiction as affect dysregulation. And she worked damn hard and she's achieved great things. First degree. And then boom, you have one. You have to go through so many small steps from the application process. Just that has a hundred steps in it by itself. Um, and then the acceptance process and then the matriculation process. It just goes on and on and on before you get to the final. And uh, the chat says sex is for baby making. And what Robert George, that Christian philosopher at Princeton, apparently his main argument against gay marriage was that every sexual act should have the possibility of procreation. That's not the Jewish perspective. Right. It, it doesn't have to be a possibility of procreation for sex to be holy, it just simply needs to be between a man and a woman who are wedded to each other.
exceptional graduation. So keep in mind that these small things that we do on a day in and day out basis are the ways that we are engaging in courtship with our partners, the glance, the look, the smile, the funny things we say, the pet names we have for each other. Um, so it's not just about a genital grab and then you're having sex all of a sudden. Um, and in addition to sex, engaging your partner and any kind of planned activity is important. It doesn't matter whether it's a date, like you're actually maybe going to the theater again, um, or you're going for a hike in the woods or a walk on the beach. But those actions demonstrate your intention, your intention. Okay, so just notice the difference between this useful, learned, commonsensical, inspiring, just awesome, awesome webinar here with Alex Katahakis and this. So when we look at the world, it's easy to feel uncertain. It's easy to feel like anything can happen at any time and there's no... Hey, instead of saying when we look at the world, what do you talk about when I look at the world? Right? We all look at the world very differently because we're different people. So why don't you start by coming to terms with your own fallibility, which is what you often do, which is why you're a pretty decent bloke. Right? Your, your, your vulnerability... It uh, it shines through, bro. Shines through. You're one of uh, George H. W. Bush's thousand points of light. Rhyme or reason, and there's no um, control, and this leads to a sense of apathy, depression, and coping. People try to derive a sense of power in very superficial ways, like video games, virtual reality, fantasy. Why don't I talk about what you do to derive a sense of power? Right, deriving a sense of power is very important to me. So, I get up early in the morning. I get up 4:30, 5 a.m. 5.30 a.m. Very rarely do I wait until 6 a.m. to get up. I get up early. I get a start to my day early. I get in a cold shower. I get a sense of power from having accomplished the most difficult part of my day first thing. Right? I, I, I drink my protein drink, take, take my, my beef organs, and then I get started on some painful and demanding exercises, which are good for me, which are helping to reduce my piriformis syndrome. I get outside, go for a walk. May go to shore, may go to a 12 step meeting. I have uh, responsibilities, people that I, I meet with in the mornings, right? I've got all these meritorious actions that I take. And through connecting with other people, connecting with meetings, connecting with a synagogue, connecting with a minion, connecting with a, a Torah class, I get energy and a sense of power. I get inspiration, right? Attending a meeting, I get power. Attending a class, I get power. Get inspiration from a YouTube video or from a rabbi or from a 12-step speaker or from a really good audio book, I get inspiration and power, right? Knowing that I've got uh, great 12-step materials that I can turn to or books that, that I can turn to for inspiration and guidance, another source of power. The maintaining and developing friendships, another source of power. Having the opportunity to share my thoughts with the world, another sense of power. Right, having these things that I need to do to, to make money, another sense of power, having money in the bank, another sense of power, investing my money in US treasuries, right? That the pay better than inflation rate, another sense of power. So there are all these things that I do to develop my sense of power. And uh, seeing seeing people on the street, uh, kibitzing with, with uh, people in the community, going to the, the dog park, uh, working out, going, going to a gym, connecting with people, all these provide a sense of power. Books, online discourse on Telegram, Twitter, at J-O-K-K-U-L-L, -L, you know, so we can retreat into things that may have some utility, but also um, I see the ways in which people retreat into ideologies where they have some kind of group where they can feel important. They can be a, a big fish. So I, I feel like Ken Brown's talking to himself here. I think it'd be more powerful if you went with the first person. In a small pond and feel important when, you know, they're kind of hiding from the rest of the world. So there is a, there is a certainty about death that, you know, when you die. <laughs> so he's going, he's going morbid. He's going dark. Like he's struggling. He sounds like he's, he's lost a lot of money on cyber currencies. He's going through a difficult time. And so he's going to a dark places that he wouldn't likely go to if he was interacting with more people face to face. Die, you're going to lose all of your authority and your agency and your body will turn to dust and your mind 
in a certain sense, it must degrade because, you know, it's, it's not very often that I speak with somebody and they say, yeah, you know, I, I just died. <laughs> like babies don't come out of the womb. Like, oh man, I just got hit by a car. Now I'm, I'm a baby. This is so okay. So there are certain very common perils to the e personality. People tend to be less considered, less, less measured. They, they make quicker decisions. They tend to be much more impulsive online. Uh, people tend to have a much uh, more inflated sense of their own importance and wisdom when they're online. They are less likely to take into account the effect of their words and actions on other people when they're online performing for a camera. And they're much more likely to go to a morbid and dark place than if they were having a face-to-face -face interaction. So weird, you know, that doesn't happen. Um, or if it does, it happens so rarely that you have to be kind of suspicious about it. Um, huh, I wonder where I am. Um, I think I might go back here pretty soon. So, so you know, if, um, I'm trying to think about this. So if there's, there's like this loss of the mind when you die, a lot of people will say that when you die, your mind is maintained and you go into heaven or hell or Abraham's wisdom or purgatory, your mind is maintained. So I grew up a Seventh-day Adventist, and Seventh-day Adventists are obsessed with what happens after you die. And so I was really happy to convert to Orthodox Judaism, which pays almost no attention to what happens after you die. So precisely because Jews and Judaism don't focus on the next life, they take this life more seriously. They take this life more passionately. It's not unknown, for example, at a Protestant funeral, the only people crying are Jews, because Jews take life and death very seriously. They, they take what happens in this world very seriously, and they don't spend much time or energy thinking about what happens after death. So religious Jews have the expectation that God rewards and punishes. But I love the Jewish priority on this life rather than on the next life. But in some senses, your mind must change. It's confronting a different reality. You're no longer on the earth. You know, for materialists, this is a pretty straightforward concept. For religious people, it's hard for them to understand that, like, your mind cannot be maintained in its current form. And your body cannot be maintained in its current form. Now, if you believe in reincarnation, then, then people have similar minds and similar bodies. But they're variations, and there's this loss of control. So, yeah, maybe if he can abstract it enough, he can get a sense of comfort from and a distraction from his own suffering. And that you are interested that you want, that you want your partner to want you also. There's a mutuality in this kind of courtship uh, that is that requires work and discipline in order to move towards what it is you want. So it's through our intention and the rich actions that we take every single day, the gratitude that we have for our partners, uh, that others know that we love them. And this would be true for your children also, or your perhaps aging parents. Um, that these are not one and done propositions, that these are day in and day out actions. And relationships require a lot of intentionality, a lot of intention. Um, we've talked about, I meant to say attention. We've talked a lot about the metaphor of a garden. Um, you can't just plant a garden and walk away from it. You have to tend to it. You have to weed it and water it and check on it and uh, fertilize it and um, make sure the dead leaves are taken off. You've got to spend a lot of time cultivating and shaping that garden, just the way we have to cultivate and shape our loves. Um, we have to let people know that we're attracted to them, that they matter to us, that we care about them by showing up. Um, and there is the adage that we should all live by that actions speak louder than words. And that's a really important statement. Um, the way that we forgive someone if they've hurt us is by watching their actions. When people change, that's when we can forgive them. Um, so these actions are essential in order for us to be able to um, have trust and safety and a sense of belonging and caring for the people around us. Okay, just a fantastic uh, webinar here by Alex Katahakis on actions. And another man of action is Tucker Carlson. So we remember very well being called a traitor to the country by people like Chuck Schumer, who obviously don't care about the country, uh, for predicting that maybe the sanctions on Russia would be counterproductive. Now, Bloomberg is reporting that, quote, some Biden officials are privately expressing concern that rather than dissuade the Kremlin as intended, American sanctions have instead exacerbated inflation, worsened food insecurity, and punished ordinary Russians more than Putin or his allies. Bloomberg noted that, quote, the collateral damage from the sanctions has been wider than expected. You think? It wasn't hard to predict. We predicted it months ago. It was obvious even then. It was lunatic. It was pushed by Ron Klain, Biden's chief of staff, who runs the country. 
We said that out loud, we were denounced as traitors for it. So here was the original argument. In order to fight tyranny, the United States must embrace collective punishment, hurt the children to bring justice. These are our values, because Vladimir Putin is a moral monster. Now, these are not traditional Western concepts of justice, but Joe Biden wholeheartedly endorses them, and so does a dominant bipartisan coalition in the United States Congress. The question is, is this a wise course? Now, we can't say. Far be it for us to suggest thinking through world-changing policies in any way before enacting them. Pausing to reflect, we have learned, is disloyal. Adult moral calculations are treason. Thinking about your own country is a crime. The immediate goal, again, the bipartisan goal, is to turn Russia into a pariah state. Now, again, the question isn't whether Vladimir Putin deserves that. It's more than a moral question. The question is, how will that work out for us and for the world? American citizens have a right to ask that question. Oh, but you don't have a right. You should be arrested. You're committing treason, say people who actually don't like America at all. So the question is, they got it wrong again. Will they ever admit it? Will they ever pay the price for getting something huge wrong? Victor Davis Hanson is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. We're honored to have him join us again tonight. Professor, thanks so much for coming on. So this all seemed kind of predictable. It's not a defense of Putin to say this was stupid. It was stupid. Now they're admitting it's stupid. Will anyone ever be punished for this? Yeah, it's an age-old rule, Tucker, of sanctions against autocratic governments that are, have impoverished populations. I mean, there's a paradox because the populations don't have a say, so they, they can't right. really, you know, they can't change policy unless they have a coup. And they're accustomed to a much lower standard of living. So if, if it's a big country like Russia that affects gas or something, we feel $7 a gallon gas or in California here, or lack of baby formula, a lot more than the Russians feel a lot worse punishment. These are people who lost 20 million in World War II. So there, there's a paradox. And that the solution was always in these Russian-speaking areas that are contested to deter him not to go further and then to have a plebiscite and see if they want to be with Putin or Ukraine. And how you get there is to resist his aggression. But the only way the Ukrainians are going to win very quickly is to do things that are unthinkable to a nuclear power. And that would be give them sh uh, shore to ship weapons to sink the Black Fleet, as people have talked about, or take out more Russian generals or conduct raids in Russia. That, that's really harebrained. And that's the type of preemptive offensive defense that would maybe give them a chance, but in itself would be crazy. And yet, the more this goes on, this Verdun-like attrition, there's going to be people thinking of that. And so it's better to just get people together and say, this is a tragedy, and let's look at these people that speak a majority, Russia, in these things, and maybe we can have a plebiscite and sanctions can be ended if people will agree. And it might not work, it probably won't work, but I don't want to see us fight uh, to the last Ukrainian to get every single Russian out of Ukraine where the majority on the border is speaking Russian. And that's not to excuse uh, Vladimir Putin, but we've no. got some really crazy people saying crazy things about a very ill dictator who's got his finger on 6,000 nuclear weapons aimed at the